So we'll go through each each one of you individually, and uh, we'll just start with with Kathy. Um, Miranda, would it be possible for me to share my screen now? Okay, perfect. Oh, great. Sure. So we'll start with Catherine Gray. So Catherine Gray is the glass working professor at Cal State San Bernardino. She received her undergraduate degree from the Ontario College of Art in Toronto and her MFA from Rhode Island School of Design. In 2017, she received the Levinsky Rikdova Award from the Pilchuk Glass School for her artistic and educational contributions to the glass field. Uh, sorry if I butchered the pronunciation. You did pretty good for it's a, Czech, it's a Czech name. You did pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> this coming fall, she will be inducted to the College of Fellow of the American Craft Council. Kathy is also a bit of a star. She is the resident evaluator for a Netflix special called Blown Away where glass blowers from around the world compete to win a grand prize. So thank you so much for joining us today, Kathy. <laughs> My pleasure to be here. Okay, let's see. Up next, we have David Zhang, David B. Zhang. Okay. Some technical juggling there, okay. So David B. Zhang is both an artist and an inventor who is known for his imaginative kinetic installations, which he uses hacked consumer electronics and household appliances. He has shown his work nationally and internationally at many, many galleries and museums, such as the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the Torrance Art Museum, the Nagasaki Museum of Fine Art uh, in Japan, and the Heritage Art Center in the Philippines, just to name a few. His work is currently installed at RAFMA for his solo exhibition entitled Endomorphism. And I have a, a photo of his exhibition as my virtual background. Um, now there's also a, a very important sound component to some of his uh, pieces that we're showing in these videos. So we'll, uh, we'll drop some links to all of the artist's websites so that you can actually go and check out the work on your own. Um, but David's work is very immersive and uh, we're kind of bummed that people can't visit the gallery right now to see it. But thank you so much for joining us today, David. Okay. So now we have Jay Beloli. And we'll jump here and here. Okay. So Jay is an independent curator and writer with a focus in contemporary art and astronomy. He was director of gallery programs at the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena, California from 1990 through 2010. Prior to that, he has nearly 20 years of experience as a curator and museum director at institutions such as the Detroit Institute of Arts, the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, and the former Baxter Art Gallery at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. Jay curated just last year, oh, excuse me, in 2000, was it 2019 or 18? Uh, 19, that's right, yeah. Jay curated uh, the exhibition Dark Event, White Horizon at RAFMA, which is what you're getting to see here in, uh, in this short little video clip. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Jay. Do it. Okay. And then next we have Stas Orlovsky. All right, Stas. Stas has exhibited throughout the U.S. with solo shows in Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, and the Bay Area. He has also been included in museum exhibitions at LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, uh, Pomona College Museum of Art, the Long Beach Museum of Art, the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, the Weatherspoon Museum of Art, and the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco, among others. Stoss was recently a part of RAFMA's Made in California exhibition, where he showed his unique installations featuring custom projections and bronze sculptures. So thanks so much for joining us today, um, Stas. And, and we just learned earlier that Stas and uh, Jay actually have 
a long history together. So uh, hope to hear a little bit about that in the, in the coming conversation. Okay, and then last, but certainly not least, we have John Fleeman. John has been the exhibition designer for Rathma since 1997. In that time, he has designed and curated dozens of exhibitions at Rathma and beyond. Prior to working for Rathma, he was preparator for the Norton Simon Museum of Art and security director for the Grand Rapids Art Museum. In the year 2000, John received the President's Outstanding Employee of the Year Award from CSUSB and the Golden Apple Award. What you're getting to see here are some, of the exam are some examples of John's uh, most creatively challenging and successful exhibition designs. Um, and among the panelists here today, John is kind of a link between all of them. He's gotten to work with uh, each of the panelists fairly closely on, uh, on different exhibitions. So John, thank you so much for being here today. Happy to be here. All right. Okay, so that's it for like the formalities of the, the panel and we kind of want this to be somewhat of a hangout. We want it to be a candid conversation. We want it to be something um, that can be a resource for artists as well. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, <clears throat> and to kind of start the conversation off, um, you know, we have a lot of different perspectives here. We have three artists. We have a curator, a writer, an exhibition designer, and curator. And uh, we, were, we were talking just before this panel started about the relationship uh, between curator and artist. And uh, I think this is maybe something that might be overlooked by artists uh, early on in their careers. And so uh, if we could start the conversation with you, Stoss, and um, the relationship you have with Jay, you had told us right before this started that you got your first exhibition coming out of grad school, is that correct? From, from Jay. Um Yes, yeah. So uh, in 1996, uh, Jay and uh, another curator, Josine Ayanko Starles, had co curated um, a really just spectacular uh, group drawing show. I believe it was called Drawn from LA. Um, yeah. And it included contemporary drawing from Los Angeles. And it, it was a range of artists uh, from emerging to uh, established. And, um, you know, somebody coming out of grad school, um, I was obviously young and, and, um, and really just learning how to function as a professional artist. And uh, so I was really grateful uh, for the opportunity from, from Jay and Josine at the time to include my work in an exhibition that, um, you know, was, uh, was a chance to show my work, not just in public, but um, be part of a conversation of uh, artists that were, you know, amongst many different generations throughout LA. So, uh, and now 25 years later, whatever it is, here we are uh, looking at each other through a computer screen, um, you know, having this conversation. It's kind of an amazing journey. I, I you know, I'm always, um, um, I, 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 you know, we just, I think as young artists, uh, sometimes you don't realize how long these relationships can last. Uh, and also, um, uh, as you heard about Jay, um, you know, he has a wealth of experience. He's been in many different institutions. And when you establish a relationship with another artist or a curator or a writer, uh, any professional relationship, you just don't know where people end up, right? So it's always a very curious thing. Um, and I'm not necessarily talking about a younger artist and a more um, seasoned curator, it could be your peers as well. I think relationships are, are, are what this thing is all about, right? Um, it's, it's establishing relationships, not just for this week or just for this show or just for this year. Um, they could last an extraordinarily long time and, and, um, um, and take you to places that you, you, know, you may not anticipate in the moment. Agreed. Um, I have some thoughts about, about that. Uh, it was so easy. Stoss, Stoss's drawings, weren't you at UCLA at the time, if I remember correctly? I was at USC. USC, okay. 
Um, the drawings were so incredibly wonderful. It was such an easy decision to make. It was really an easy decision to make. And, uh, you know, the best, the best job you can do as a curator is to be incredibly open and not uh, be judged, just to look at work and, uh, you know, and follow all your experience and all your um, caring, if you will, to make the decisions that you make. I think the best curators are the ones that basically really are there to service art rather than to, um, how to say this, rather than to be a careerist. If you're there to serve art, I think that's really the best curators that I've known uh, because they've really done an incredible job. And, uh, you know, I do think uh, you can have both as you do with somebody um, like Paul Schimmel, who uh, helped a lot of artists and also did a pretty good job with his own career. But uh, he also did a lot for a lot of artists who didn't have a lot of recognition. So he basically took them on and, uh, and showed their work. Kathy, you've been on, on both sides of this, really, as an artist working with a curator, uh, much more so. But you've also curated exhibitions, I know, because I worked with you on, on several of them. What, what's, what was your experience of you know, stepping on the other side of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the exhibit, so to speak? Um, the curating is hard work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think um, from the outside looking in, it doesn't seem like it would be that hard, but it, there's a lot to think about in terms of the content of the work, the scale of the work, um, the actual look of the work, how it might all fit together, especially for a group exhibition when you have lots of different artists as opposed to curating a, a solo exhibition of one artist's work. Um, it does give you a new appreciation for how much is um, involved in, in curating exhibitions. Um, but it also, I, I want to reiterate uh, Stas's point, how important it is to kind of maintain um, good relationships with people because um, you will run into these people again, guaranteed. Um, you know, so if you um, are as an artist, if you're a prima donna about how you want your work exhibited or making kind of crazy demands about um, having your work included in shows, that, um, you know, can leave a bad taste in people's mouths, whether it's the curator or the exhibition designer or other artists that might be in the show as well. And yeah. those things can come kind of come back to haunt you. So, I mean, it's not to say to, you know, not you know, make sure that you are happy with how your work is being presented, but at the same time, know that, you know, this isn't probably going to be the only time that you deal with these people, that you will, these are the, the maybe the beginning of, a, of long-standing relationships. Yeah. Catherine, I have a thought, which is something that I need to share as a curator. Usually when you give a curator I'm uh, sorry, give an artist an opportunity to be in an exhibition or do a one person show, um, they're believing in them. And uh, it's only the rare artist that behaves badly. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and that's really what I can tell you from my experience. There are a couple of artists that I will never work with again, but it's very, very few. And uh, there's one famous artist I never wanted to work with because I knew what monster he was. But, um, but by and large, uh, when you do a show with an artist, uh, they know that you believe in them and you believe in what they're doing. And um, so most of my exhibitions I've organized in my life were really pleasurable because uh, it was a sense of basically, you know, uh, a sense of belief and a sense of caring and the artist got it. And uh, so um, that's my response to uh, that. So there are very few people I might want to work with again. That's good to hear. I mean, I feel like most artists are really thrilled that somebody is interested in showing their work and will do whatever it takes to make sure that their work gets in whatever exhibition it is. So related to this conversation, we do have one question um, in the chat and it says from Carly Lake, for an artist wanting to make a body of work for a solo exhibition, what is the best way to approach a gallery or curator? And is it imperative to already have a particular series completed? Can you be in progress? Yes. 
you can't yes. make progress. Um, the classic bad story I can tell you, which is a Joseph Yonko story, uh, story, story, was basically the person who came in and said, I want a one person show. And he said, well, you know, um, what does it work like? And the artist said, oh, well, I haven't made it yet. <laughs> so, um, so the reality is that yes, uh, if you want an exhibition at a gallery or at a, a, you know, a nonprofit exhibition space, you better have done a lot of work, really. Uh, you have to get a sense that basically this is a major commitment for you and that you've worked really, really hard at what you're doing. That is a given. You cannot, you know, the one way that you can expect an exhibition is a jury show like the ones that happen at the uh, uh, at the um, LA, um, uh, the LA City um, uh, Gallery and uh, in parts of the park, there is a drink that I think it's still happening every year. And then you don't have to make any uh, work. You know, you get opportunities sometimes to see it, like, a little bit of work. But in terms of a gallery or in terms of a major nonprofit space, there has a significant amount of work done. Well, Jay, you and I have, this is a, you know, I'm from my side of it, when we have the, the relationship of the exhibition designer and curator, which you and I have, have been, had that relationship before, as well as with Kathy Gray on this panel, um, not, until you go through it as an artist, uh, you know, the, the exhibit that we did of Rabia, we, we met with her and you and I went to her studio and we, we both, you know, we came with the idea that we, we wanted to give her an exhibit, but we weren't really sure what it would look like. I uh, remember that that visit, and we sat down and, and had a long meeting with her and looked at her, her work, and, and I really loved the drawings, as did you, but we weren't really sure how the exhibition was going to come together with the sculptures and with with the, the drawings and which paintings. So, um, and, and through that, I was... I feel like the exhibition is is kind of follows this intuitive creative process as well. Uh, so it doesn't. I, I don't think that I've ever had an exhibit or worked with a cur or worked with a curator, and we had it all figured out from the very beginning. It just kind yeah. of it kind of changed and grew, and where we thought we were going uh, quite often isn't where we ended up at all. And I think that was true with Rabia. In fact, I was so taken by her small sculptures that you remember we, we I, I almost felt bad afterwards, but I encouraged her to make this giant oversized sculpture that would fill this, <laughs> this room. Yeah. She, she, you know, I don't know how she got enough wool. For those of you who don't know, Rabia's sculptures were made of, uh, of wool and, and she had to build this big structure that barely fit in, in her studio. And she spent months working on this thing. And I remember uh, feeling so responsible that I had uh, sort of encouraged that. She got excited about it and wanted to do it, but uh, her hands were cramping and all. I mean, she went through a lot of uh, pain and suffering to make this thing. And I thought, God, I hope this this really works out. She's going to hate me. In fact, when we we sent, um, uh, I think it was Cook's Crating or one of the fine art shipping companies to pick it up, it was too big to get out of the studio. So they had to they had to take it out uh, a, a window and lift it onto the street into into this into this truck in in parts and uh, so that you know you you don't really know and I know that in, in Jay and I have worked together on on Rabia's and, and, and another exhibition as well and where there is a, a large body of work and the curators may you know, like a, a certain body of work, but, and this is another point I wanted to make and for the, to ask the panel, because I've experienced this as well, but there's a, sometimes there's a, there's a big space between what the curator wants to exhibit of that artist and what the artist wants to exhibit and bringing that together to meet in the middle uh, with the right balance is sometimes challenging. Uh, you know, most, artists that, that I've worked and have done hundreds of these exhibitions over the years. They, and I've seen this happen, I mean, as a curator and then, uh, and then you know, as an, an exhibit designer kind of between the two, I've seen this struggle happen where the, the artist will want to show the latest body of work, but the curator might not want to see that, you know, it doesn't, 
it doesn't fit the vision of the of the curator and that's a difficult place to be in because it is a celebration and uh, you know, institutionally, we, we are all trying to, to present and bring the vision of the artist to reality. But sometimes that's that's not a, a, you know, a straight road. There's a lot of curves and winds and, and some stony paths to, to get there sometimes. And, you know, we all, people come to the exhibits and they see it, and it, it but everyone's happy. And, you know, we, we've, we've come to uh, the conclusion of, of, of making that a reality. But there's a whole lot that happened from that, that, that initial meeting that you and I had with Rabia to, to the opening reception. And uh, I think that's a struggle for, you know, I work with as an advisor to some of the, to well, the MF, all the MFA grads over the past many years at, at, uh, at Cal State, um, San Bernardino. And I, and I see that with them as being young up and coming artists themselves. Uh, sometimes they don't they don't like uh, the advice that you give them from a curatorial or a design perspective, and it's it's hard to to get that message uh, through that and and they that we're on their team and that we you know that like Jay said to be open and I think that would be the advice I would give from what I've experienced and seen professionally. Uh, you know there there is that struggle and. and and like Kathy was saying, you have to be careful, and, and Stoss as well. Those relationships that you that you make are pretty important. So, you know, being, you know, willing to collaborate and be open. Maybe, you know, some of the the things that are exhibit are not exactly what you want, but you know, artists tend to see their their work in a a narrow uh, vision, where curators and designers kind of see it as a whole. And how do those talk to each other in an exhibit in the in a curatorial group and and how you know you, you don't really know what that is uh sometimes until you get it into the space so the changes it happen i've seen artists kind of freak out like oh I, but this is what we were going to do and and the curator the designer just say well i think this let's try this and uh you, you know sometimes that's the wrong idea but i think just i would say be open and understand that this is a creative process as well it's very hard for the artist. I mean, I, I'm well aware that basically, and it's what it needs to be, that whoever the artist is, they're most interested in the work that they're dealing with right now. Those are the challenges. Uh, and um, and they're, you know, they're trying to figure out what, where that work is going, um, uh, even in a little piece of the uh, whole, you know, whole group body of work over, uh, over the last year or so. That is really hard for the artists because that's what they're focusing on. That's what they have to focus on as artists, you know, in terms of what they're dealing with now. So that always, you know, that can create problems. I mean, it doesn't, which, you know, it, 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 it's not often that it does, but sometimes it does. You're right, John. I've had, I've had some experiences like that. If I can direct the uh, conversation back to the first part of that question, how do you approach a gallery or a curator? Now, obviously, th that you don't want to approach someone and be too pushy about having a show. Where's the fine balance there? I I've heard that perhaps you need to kind of lay down a foundation with that person, develop a relationship prior to even mentioning that you're an artist or that you want a show or anything like that. Um, so how, how do you kind of like tread that line and how do you develop or how would you recommend developing genuine relationships, uh, working relationships with these tentatives? Um, what do you want to do that? I know. I do something. Somebody else should talk about that one. So, um, was was the the uh, the question from an artist's point of view of how to develop those relationships? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I, I I guess from an artist point of view, um, I, I would say that, um, uh, you know, uh, it all starts with maintaining relationships with other artists, I think. Um, you know, you all have friends. If you're an emerg emerging artist, you all have people you respect and people um, who are making work that are part of your cohort, whether it's um, through school or some other form of community. Um, and if you are uh, generous and smart about things, then you share information and you share resources. 
And, um, you know, you develop relationships, not just uh, between you and a curator or a gallery, but um, if you're maintaining those relationships with other artists, then hopefully they'll hear of something that's relevant for you. And um, maybe they'll recommend um, you for an exhibition opportunity. Um, but um, I think we all know the difference between people that uh, have a sense of uh, uh, panic about them about these things where it feels like, you know, they're um, constantly running around trying to, you know, trying to figure something out. But if you really do have uh, a cohort of people that um, you genuinely are interested in, I think that's a great place to start, right? That's a great place to start and, uh, and uh, as your kind of center for resources. And then beyond that, just go out. You know, I know uh, it's ironic that we're talking about this uh, under these circumstances, but as, as uh, I was thinking about this earlier, my inbox is filled every day with um, invitations for these Zoom studio visits or a Zoom conversation. And uh, everybody's trying to make the best of every kind of situation. I was talking to an artist friend of mine who I invited to give a guest lecture for my students. Uh, and um, we were uh, talking about this and you know, his perspective was that um, it's hard to get a curator or a gallerist over to your studio under the best of times, right? They have to get into the car, they have to fight traffic. And if they're gonna come visit you, um, you're asking them to essentially eliminate a full business day, really. I mean, half if they're lucky. It's a lot, it's a lot to ask for. But under these conditions, I mean, everybody's at home for the most part and um, uh, pretty forgiving and generous about uh, everybody's situation. So even in these circumstances, you could be creative and think about, you know, what could you put out there? How could you engage people? Um, what might be something that might interest someone to drop in on and, and, um, uh, and be a part of, uh, both in physical space, but I think, uh, unfortunately for us uh, at the moment in virtual space too, that, that definitely is, uh, is important. And, um, you know, uh, why should somebody support you if you don't support them, right? So go out, educate yourself about what's happening. And just because somebody has a gallery doesn't mean that they are gonna show anything. So go figure out uh, who's showing what, what they're interested in, what they're sympathetic yes. to, and find the right place for you. And I think understand that 99.9999% of people out there could care less about what you do and they're not interested in what you're doing, but there is that 1% that may be. So look for those people that are sympathetic to what you're interested in, what you're doing, find your tribe, and you know, um, uh, go out there and develop those relationships. And then things, I think, evolve from there. Well, I have uh, so many things are happening on mine. And uh, when I first came to LA, um, I didn't have any connection at all. Um, I used to uh, make a lot of submissions. I would make between 50 to 100 submissions a year. And if I get lucky, I may get one or two exhibitions. And, and that's how I start. And from there, one by one, everything becomes like chain reaction. You get like connections of artist to artist and curators to curator. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And this kind of leads into a, a question we had sent in, in in advance. And it was directed towards you, Kathy, because uh, she's a glass artist. But uh, her question was kind of two part. The first is, uh, is the way to success as an artist through talent or is it through hard work? And, uh, and in addition, she asked if you could recommend any other talented artists in the, in the glass field, I'm imagining. Um, well, it's definitely a combination of both, uh, talent and hard work. And I feel like if you um, have a lot of one and not much of the other, that will get you so far, but it might not get you as far as you wanna go. So you really kind of need both. Um, in my in my opinion um as for uh i mean there's lots of great artists out there in glass and otherwise i'm not knowing the person's interests in particular i wouldn't know how to direct them 
you could give them um, my email and they could e email me directly and with, me with a bit more information, I'd be happy to make suggestions because I feel like I would just be, you know, grasping at straws a little bit. Kathy has both, by the way, hard work and, and talent. <laughs> oh, stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we have a few questions in the, the Q&A. This first one comes from Sal Kennedy Ross, and she asks, do you find yourself going back to older pieces and working on them again? Uh, David, I'm going to ask you to answer this question first, and I, I think it's relevant because your work is kind of always evolving. So, I do, always do. Um, my uh, projects are based on research, lifetime research that I do about self-organizing system. Um, I tend to go back to uh, um, pieces that I worked on like as long as like as far as 10 years ago. Some of the uh, um, vibrating uh, how uh, electrical mechanism works or so the, um, the electrical fans or uh, even programming uh, circuit boards and uh, electronic parts. It, it's one of those things that you have to constantly educate yourself and uh, um, um, time to time um, even like five to 10 years from now, I may be in a better position to develop those older projects in a better way. So I always like to go back to older pieces and keep redeveloping them time to time. I, I, I might add to another perspective on that is I, I never do. I just kind of feel like once a piece is made, it's done. I might like think about the idea some more and maybe it will manifest itself in different ways, but um, and maybe it's also just the different media that we work in, the different materials we use. It's just not really always possible. I mean, I will sometimes like rework a piece, but usually it's like within a year or two of making it, if I make it and not totally happy with it. But yeah, I, ne well, I never revisit old work. Um, I, I, my, my entire process of making is about... Um, uh, cannibalizing my work um, over time. So it's, it's interesting. I think because of collage and uh, painting and drawing, certainly there's different ways of working. My, my particular process, I really do. I can have a failed painting hang out in the studio for years. Um, and then I look at it one day and I realize, oh, I, I think I know how to solve this. Um, or sometimes it goes through multiple iterations and ends up in the trash can and sometimes it doesn't but um but yeah i i, I would say that would, might be a true um statement for my process i i definitely go back and um you know uh keep pushing something until it's completely dead i haven't noticed that about your work stops uh, on on this uh, conversation, we, we have another question that kind of falls in line from Alyssa Vidal. Uh, readiness and completion can seem over elusive. The desire to dive back into an idea or individual work can sometimes overshadow the satisfaction of what has been accomplished already. What advice do you have to offer in the crossing over from revision to completion? Perhaps that. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll dive into that. Um, I think that's sort of the, um, the at, at the center of how everyone makes work, right? Is um, it, it kind of ties back to what we were speaking about just a moment ago. Um, you know, uh, revision is uh, for better or worse part of the process of, of making something uh, until you sort of lost it and, um, and you can't can't revise it anymore. Uh, so I think um, everybody has a way of kind of understanding when something is done. Uh, and um, uh, I think it's different, obviously, uh, for, for everyone. Um, and some people work more intuitively, some people work in a much more kind of programmatic, uh, organized uh, fashion. Um, but uh, you know, the idea of, of revision is, uh, I think, key uh, to making work. I can't imagine, um, you know, a process that doesn't involve that uh, dance or that very, very, very precarious balance between 
uh, revising something and destroying something, or probably worse yet. Um, and I think um, I see that if I was to think about young work or artists that are younger and they're starting out, I would in a heartbeat take something that's been overworked than something that hasn't been pushed far enough, right? So uh, I would, I love failure. I'd love to see somebody fail um, in, in the best sense of the word, right? Where they really push themselves out of a comfort zone and you could see what they're trying to do. Maybe it didn't work, but you could see what they're trying to get at. And that's beautiful. Um, even if the final product may not be beautiful, but that process is really hard to fake. Um, you know, when somebody's struggling with something and it's visible, that's a beautiful thing. It's not so wonderful when you see somebody stop short, you know, cause maybe they're hesitant or fearful or unsure. That's an entirely different thing. So, uh, you know, uh, I, when you're revising something and unsure of when it's done, I always err on the side of pushing it to the brink. And then if you lose it, you lose it. You make another one. So what's that famous quote? The, uh, the ability to create comes with the courage to destroy. Was that Picasso or somebody that said that? I can't remember, but that's what I'm thinking of listening this, to Stoss. I think that's, that's great advice. Now, I think um, one of the things I do believe uh, over the years is usually among the best works, not the best work, it's the one that basically was the biggest struggle for the artist. You know, the one that basically took a huge amount of effort. And uh, you can see it, you know, and, you know, and of course the other issue about is where you stop, which is also a key, a, um, a key issue for um, the artistic decision. But basically, you know, so many times, uh, artists have talked to me and said, oh, you like that work? That was the hardest one for me to do. And uh, the work is visible, you know, and uh, the energy is visible in that work, I think, really. Kathy, I'm kind of interested how you feel uh, this might translate into your work that's so heavy on the technical end that, you know, a lot of times you either get it right in, in that first go or, or not. And yeah, I, I kind of, I'm interested in this perspective because I, I kind of practice in, in some similar ways where there's no real, you can't go back and fix it if you don't get it right necessarily the first time. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, I mean, I think how, how Stoss answered the question was, was really accurate. And I feel like it does have parallels when you are working in a material that is really technically demanding. I think what happens is, you don't think of what you're doing as revisions necessarily. You know, you just maybe are trying to get something just so, um, and you're just doing the same thing over and over again. That's not necessarily that you're changing anything. You're just trying to really get it the way that you want it. And, um, you know, with that kind of practice, I think eventually you get to the point where it is very, you know, fluid and comes really quickly and it doesn't seem like there's the same kind of effort because there's been all this like hours and hours that you haven't seen that have got you to this point where you can be that, um, you know, accomplished and, and facile with what, whatever your media is. Um, it is tricky when you, when your material is really technically demanding, but I, I feel like all materials are technically demanding. I know that's something that people say about glass blowing and some other materials for sure that there's so much technique that you have to know. But I feel like that's true with everything, painting, drawing, photography, um, clay, everything's got technique, you know, there's no way that you're just gonna, you know, open a box of paints and make an amazing painting right off the bat, you know, so I feel like there's, it's just various learning curves and, um, you know, people have their uh, different capacities for how much they want to devote to how much time they want to spend perfecting their, their media. Absolutely. Okay, the, the next question we have from the Q&A is from Daniel Escamilla, and he's asking, where do you guys find your, your motivation for creating? And if, if I can, I'd like to direct this over to David to start off. Uh, for me, uh, 
motivation is, it comes from everyday life, um, curiosity, uh, want to understand how um, everything works. Uh, so um, I used to be a painter for over 15 years and uh, um, start questioning what it means to be an artist and um, um, just having interest with all this moving uh, things, performing how um, paint and uh, artwork is able to come together and then come to meaning. And uh, um, at this point, I came to um, my own research and study about the self-organizing systems, which involves in uh, within physical, chemical, biological, social, and, and engineered. Um, so I tend to look at everything uh, from uh, technology to um, even like fruits, vegetables, or any um, anything that I tend to encounter and see, and and I become very curious about things and uh, how those um, uh, everyday life environment can be translated to relationship to myself as, as an artist and how I can express them and uh, continuously discover and explore within the art um, material. Awesome, thank you. Stas, uh, would you like to add to that as well? Yeah, I, I think sometimes, um, you know, there's a um, confusion between motivation and, and inspiration. And um, I think, uh, you know, motivation can come from um, many different sources, it, it, and it does. I mean, from a psychological perspective, I, I, I know people that are motivated by a fear of failure. I know people that are motivated by, you know, money. People are motivated by love or need for acceptance. I mean, there's psychologically, that's a very complicated thing, but I think in a more functional um, way to answer the question for myself, um, the, the minute I realized that if I just treated this like a regular uh, job, meaning that I, if I didn't feel like going to the studio, that was just too bad. I still went, right? So it doesn't matter whether you're inspired or you're up for it or you're not up for it. Um, it doesn't matter if you have ideas or you don't have ideas. There have been plenty of days where I've gone to the studio and I've spent eight hours and I've swept the floor, I've cleaned up, I've done everything humanly possible. Um, there's been plenty of days where I went to the studio and in like one day I have undone two months worth of work. You know, it's part of it. It's, it's too bad. It sucks, but that's that's part of it. And so um, I think if you you, or for me, what I've realized very quickly is I, I can't intellectualize my way um, out of a problem. I have to kind of work through it, right? Like that's not true for everybody, but for me, that's the case. I can't think my way out of um, a situation. I have to be drawing, cutting, pasting, moving, adjusting. And sadly, that means I have to be in my studio to do that. I can't be at the beach. Um, I mean, sometimes I can, sometimes, you know, sometimes I could be in the shower and the beach and, and, and go, oh my God, I got it. And, but that's rare. Most of the time it's just me fumbling, you know, hanging on for dear life, you know, thinking, please let this work. But um, it's just work. It's just work. You just go in and, and, and you work and a work does, I mean, it's a cliche, but work comes out of work for me, not for everybody, but for me personally, work can only come out of work. There's no substitute for it. They're just not for me. I haven't found it yet. If there was some other way, I would do it in a heartbeat. I would, I would completely, I would take it any day of the week, but that's just not, that's, that's not, sadly for me, that's not my deal. I'm just, I'm in here trying to figure it out like everybody else, you know, hoping for the best. It's not a mystery. Um, you know, there's nothing magical about it. Uh, it just, it, it is just like everything else. No different in my experience. Stas, I think uh, you have what it takes to be a motivational speaker. I feel motivated <laughs> yeah. after that. <laughs> I feel inspired to make work again. <laughs> 25 years. Oh, my job is done. Oh, I don't care about John. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you haven't seen anything yet. Jay, be careful. There's a reason I became an exhibit designer. <laughs> so, I did not become a painter. 
which is what I study. Yeah. So I, I'd like to direct this next question towards uh, UJ and, and John. Um, Tifei is asking, Tifei Griffin, she says, is there any value in staging your own exhibition? Value in my what's the question again? Diego? Is there any value in staging your own exhibition? What do we mean by staging? I would imagine probably, you know, the artist is either curating their own exhibition or finding the space themselves to, to host an exhibition rather than working through a, a gallery or through a curator. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it, it's, it's important to do, I mean, if you have the opportunity to do it, obviously, if you, if you had the opportunity to have an exhibition designer and a curator and all those, those professionals that can kind of help bring, uh, you know, uh, advise you and direct you to get to bring your vision to reality, like I was talking before, that's great. But, you know, part of the, the MFA program at Cal State, uh, it, Kathy's been the grad coordinator for, for years and we've watched this, we challenge the students to, to do just that, to really go through this, process uh, completely on their on their own I mean we advise them and kind of point them in the right direction but we also let them fail to to a certain degree and that's where you learn and that's where you you start to appreciate um, I, how like Jay was saying uh, curating is hard uh, designing an exhibition is is tough choosing all those the uh, you know having all those different decisions to make and uh you know figuring it out and uh kind of experiencing what it's like to make the mistake and and, and you know i think that's the way that you learn so i think anytime you have an opportunity to do that if that's the only one you have certainly do it and maybe even if you do have an opportunity to do uh you know both i think you can learn so much from doing that in fact i didn't study <laughs> exhibit design or or uh, was not a curatorial uh, major in, in college. I was a studio artist. I had gallery representations outside of, uh, when, after I graduated, but went back to grad school and thought, what am I gonna do? And, and I uh, got an internship at a museum and in the curatorial department, working in, with collections and uh, in the registrars. And it was the, the, the most boring thing I've ever done. I thought I was, <laughs> lose my mind and then I met the exhibit designer and I didn't even know there was such a thing as an exhibit designer and so uh, you know slowly I just you know learned through uh, screwing up for like 10 years you know making a lot of mistakes and uh, you know problem solving like we, Kathy and I talk about this a lot when discussing the, the grad students and their progression that uh, we have to be forced to solve problems and uh, whether that's in your work, uh, you know, like Stoss was saying, figure it out. You, you, you got to do that. And you learn so much more doing that than, than somebody telling you exactly what to do and, and, and why, I think. And then you trust yourself. And I think it's a lot about trusting, uh, you know, that endeavor to keep pushing things or to keep trying uh, something different and really uh, looking at your, stepping back and looking at your artwork as somebody else might approach it. And that's really, I think the struggle that uh, that students who are, are students or artists who are doing an exhibit for the first time is really being able to step step back and look at it as somebody else would approach it. Jay, would you like to add to that? To the question of uh, is there value in staging your own exhibition? I think maybe we lost Jay. Well, I'm here. I'm just oh, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> um, Jay thought my answer was so ridiculous that he doesn't even want no, to. No, 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 at all. I'm just thinking about it. I mean, um, you know, I haven't had that experience. Uh, you know, um, there have been times when uh, I've done things outside, and uh, you know, and just basically the artist. But, did. There was a wonderful, uh, at the Armory for a while, we had a huge warehouse space. And I just let the artists in that situation do what they wanted. 
You know, I mean, I knew what they were capable of doing in general, but basically just let them do what they wanted. And so it was really on them to what they were going to do in that particular um, circumstance. Uh, so, um, you know, but uh, John is right. If, if you're an artist and you try and do your own show, you, you know, you have, you will learn a lot. It may not come out wonderfully, but you will learn a lot because in fact, the difference between having work on your studio wall or in your studio space and having it in another space is vast. It really changes everything because by putting it in another space, you look at it differently. And that's really, you know, if they do their own show, they will still have that experience of looking at that work differently by having it somewhere else. Can I, can I chime in on, on something? Yeah, absolutely. No, Stas, you, that's it. You can't. <laughs> uh, I, I think as an emerging or a young artist, if you're waiting for a curator to give you a show, you'll be waiting a really long time. Yeah. Um, so um, not because, um, you know, of, of, you know of, most of the time it's just, there's just so much, right? There's just, everybody's lives are full and they've got a lot of commitments and it's not because they hate you or, but um, as an artist, you, you know, go out and find your own space and again, get your friends. And as, uh, as you've heard, you, you will learn a tremendous amount. I mean, I, again, I think of my students of, of what Jay just said, um, the, you know, just if you're a painter and when you move your work out of your studio into another space, as Jay mentioned, uh, maybe your studio had incandescent light that you were painting in, but then the exhibition space is fluorescent light. It's a different temperature light. And then you stick it up on a wall and you're like, oh, this doesn't look like what I thought it looked like. I don't recognize my, no, so lighting, um, just something as basic as that, that one little tiny incidental that seems like it's incidental could just have a huge impact in the way that your work is perceived. And if you don't have that knowledge, that experience by going out and doing something yourself, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a shame. Uh, and Southern California has a fabulous um, tradition and history of um, nonprofit spaces and alternative spaces, especially during recessions and yeah. economic setbacks when galleries close and all of a sudden there's less opportunity to show your work in those kinds of spaces. That's precisely where artists go out, they find, a, find empty storefronts for the weekend. Uh, you know, uh, any space that you can get your hands on and do, you do it yourself. You put on a show, you um, use your own mailing lists, you beg people for their mailing lists. You know, you pull money and you get some beer um, and, uh, you know, and you, and you put on a show. Maybe it's just a one evening event. Um, do it yourself. And then I think, uh, as was mentioned, you know, you appreciate what it involves to really put a show together from a curatorial standpoint, and then how to design a show from an exhi exhibition design standpoint, how to write a press release, how to reach out to people. Um, I mean, these are all skills that um, as your work leaves your studio and you put it out into the world, you have to have. Nobody's going to do it for you basically is what I'm saying. Until later, maybe. <laughs> Good luck. Awesome, thank you. Uh, David, Catherine, would you guys like to chime in on that? Uh, I mean, I would add that, you know, to echo Stoss a little bit, but, you know, I think it's really important to like make your own opportunities and you have those skills as an artist. And there are lots of ways that you can get your work out there. And I feel like there's so many other ways to exist in the art world rather than just showing your work in commercial galleries. Um, and nowadays too, with all the stuff that's happening online, in the streets and pop-up spaces, there is a lot more opportunities than there used to be for getting your work out there. You don't necessarily have to, you know, cur curators and gallerists and museums are not necessarily the gatekeepers to your like entree into the art world anymore. Point. I think for me, uh, the, uh, the what exhibition uh, could work uh, really different. Um, since I do 
uh, experimental installation work. Um, I do a lot of my own exhibition in my studio, although I don't invite anybody to see my work, but the whole exhibition process is just for me to explore and, and learn things and discover. And um, the term called uh, creation, um, I always had a big problem with it because yeah, I don't believe any humans can create things. Uh, we can only uh, rediscover and reconfigure everything. So um, during the progress of experimenting with the new projects at my studio uh, and exhibiting in my studio, and uh, some of the projects uh, would exist only once and that it would never be in an exhibition again. Uh, but only thing that I have left is the yeah, um, photos and videos. And that part, just that progress is good enough for me sometimes. Yeah, I think this is all very valuable. And one of the things that I, I feel was most valuable in my own practice was starting to think about that final stage is what does the work look like in a gallery or what is an interaction with someone else in that work actually look like and what do I intend for that to work, uh, for that relationship to look like. So I think it's really interesting uh, that you know, artists are doing that and that uh, I, I think it is a valuable process to go out and, and do that for yourself and kind of experiment and, and see what that's like. Uh, I think it adds a lot to the creation process as well. Um, so. Something very important that basically it's changed in terms of the uh, of the possibilities that you have. And that's really wonderful for artists because, you know, there, there are more, thank God, um, galleries, there are more uh, non-profit spaces than there used to be, but never enough. And basically, you know, uh, a lot of it, uh, both in terms of what we're doing now, um, uh, in terms of things I've seen online and so on, there are a lot more possibilities, they really are. So look out for those nonprofit spaces. All right, so uh, we'll take one more question here to kind of conclude the session. This, uh, this question comes from Kandra Scullin. What advice, and um, I think we'll start with David and then we'll go Stas, Catherine, Jay. I'll, I'll give you all an opportunity to answer this question, but what advice um, do you have for emerging artists? It could be general. Hmm. Well, like I was started, you, you, um, keep yourself busy with the uh, making your art, um, keep progressing and uh, develop, and uh, um, make a lot of submissions in the beginning um, to galleries and uh, you know jewelry exhibitions, and from there everything uh, has the you know chain reaction, so eventually um, you know you get better at you know getting connections and your artwork develops. And take it step by step. Awesome. Thank you, David. Stas? Um, don't do it. If, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't really want to do it, like if you're <laughs> really, really, you know, if you're not all in, then save yourself the heartache and all the nonsense and go do something else and like have a really you know, great life. Um, <laughs> uh, if you really, really must do it, then um, I think that's sort of where it starts. Like you really have to, it's like, um, it is an interesting question because I, I don't rem I don't know if I really asked myself that question because that's the only thing I was ever going to do. So it's not like, oh, you know, am I going to do this or am I going to do that? It was just like, I guess this is what I'm going to do. So um, make sure you want to do it. If you're an emerging artist, make sure you really, really want to do it. Um, there's, if you love art, um, there's lots of different ways to be around art. Um, and you still can be, but if you, you know, in terms of making art and, and being an artist, that's a whole other, I think, level of, uh, of commitment that you want to be prepared to, um, you know, work hard on, on all levels. And, and I think the other thing I, I would say is, um, uh, you know, make sure that you have some skills, right? Because most likely you're going to be needing to support yourself um, at various times in your career doing something um, uh, at various times that maybe is, is not just studio work, um, whatever that may be. So uh, I would think 
uh, long and hard and, and, um, and if this is what you really want to do, then awesome. But my first uh, piece of advice is think about it. <laughs> it's funny, it starts, that's exactly what happened to me. I wanted to be an artist. I thought I had it, but um, I had enough skill to, to, to fake it, you know, and, uh, but it, you have to ask that question am I really obsessed with this? Is this, you know, do I have what it, what it takes to do that? And I did, but it was, um, I was not obsessed with it. I was, like I said, skillful enough to make it look like I was, you know, making smart art, but it really wasn't. Um, but it led me into, to the career that I have now, which, which I love. So it can, it can take you, uh, down a path that you may not have, uh, of winning. And now, you know, having these cre uh, these creative collaborations with with uh, people I've worked with all of you uh, now that's a pretty rewarding thing and uh, so that creative angst doesn't necessarily have to be with becoming some you know uh, successful artist but you can appreciate uh, the process but having that kind of honesty is, is tough I had it but you know I think I wish that I would have had enough to become uh, you know, successful artist, but it wasn't, I wasn't not obsessed with it. Obsessed with creating, being a part of this. But um, I certainly didn't have the hard work that Stoss and David and, and uh, Kathy, I might've had some of the skill, but I didn't have the, the hard work and the dedication that they had, that you guys have. Well, I think it goes back to that expression, like find what you love, do what you love and you won't work a day in your life. You know, like, no if you can't picture yourself doing anything else you will just be hopefully that dedicated and passionate about what you're doing that that will carry the day i think that's accurate um i uh, in terms of uh, starting out you know if you want to and, and um with everything that everybody said about you have that commitment i think john, john o'brien who had one of the best things that i ever heard which basically Try and stop, and if you can't, you're meant to be an artist. But uh, the, the thing I would say to the the, um, the artist starting out, if is you know what you said is basically you've got to have that commitment. That basically, jury chose, and I think David said that um, the one the musical art gallery. I think there's still one, Angel's Gate, which is really usually very well juried. It's a way to get your work out there. I mean, the classic I can remember is. Um, uh, with, um, oh gosh, uh, there was one artist that I saw um, in the jury show at the Municipal Art Gallery, and uh, it was clear that this was really, really good work. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wound up basically including a number of shows, but, you know, the only way I found him is because he was in the jury show at the Municipal Art Gallery. Uh, and I think the same thing happened in the jury show at the um, you know, at Angel's Gate, I don't know if you're still doing those. I hope the Smart Gallery is still doing their great show. Even the open show uh, sometimes has amazing things in it at the New Smart Gallery. So if you're starting out and if you really care about doing it, those are some of the options. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Um, yeah, I, I think it's also important to remember there are a multitude of ways to contribute to the art world and Maybe not all of us are, are panned out to be artists, but, uh, but we can still be involved in the art world. Um, and I think those components are, are just as important as the artists as well, right? A, a reciprocal relationship kind of tying back to the, the beginning uh, of this conversation with that relationship between curator and artist. Uh, you know, the conversation goes both ways. Um, but yeah, thank you all for, for joining us today. And uh, thank you. Yeah. David and Catherine, I was really glad to see, you know, examples of your work. I didn't know about either of you. So that's really a pleasure for me. Yeah, likewise. Likewise to see everybody else's work too. And Stas, I'm going to send you an email because I want to find out more about you being from Toronto and maybe you might know people that I know that went to York. <laughs> Thinking the exact same thing. Well, All right. <laughs> right. Uh, Diego, Stas, great to see you. I'm great to see you. Good to Bye see everybody. you guys again. Yeah. All right. Everyone.
I just like to remind everyone uh, in the chat and, and watching that this conversation will be on our website next week. So that if you came in a little late and you didn't get to, get to see the beginning, um, you'll get to see the whole recording uh, on our website. All right, but uh, yeah, that'll conclude it. Thank